everyone, so here we are with chapter 29, Mrs Beamish Worries. Back in Chewville, Spittleworth made sure the story was circulated that the Dovetail family had packed up in the middle of the night and moved to the neighbouring country of Pluritania. Daisy's former teacher told her classmates and Kankabee the footman informed all the play palace servants. After he got home from school that day, Bert went to lay on his bed, staring up at the ceiling. He was thinking back to the days when he'd been a small, plump boy whom the other children called Butterball, and how Daisy had always stuck up for him. He remembered their long ago fight in the palace courtyard and the expression on Daisy's face when he'd accidentally knocked her hopes of heaven to the ground on her birthday. Then Bert considered the way he spent his break times these days. At first, Bert had sort of liked being friends with Roderick Roach because Roderick used to bully him and he was glad he'd stopped. But if he was truly honest with himself, Bert didn't really enjoy the same things that Roderick, Roderick did. For instance, trying to hit stray dogs with catapults or finding live frogs to hide in the girls' satchels. In fact, the more he remembered the fun he used to have with Daisy, the more he thought about how his face ached from fake smiling at the end of a day with Roderick. And the more Bert regretted that he'd never tried to repair his and Daisy's friendship. But it was too late now. Daisy was gone forever, gone to Pluritania. While Bert was lying on his bed, Mrs Beamish sat alone in the kitchen. She felt almost as bad as her son. Ever since she'd done it, Mrs Beamish had regretted telling the scullery maid what Mr Dovetail had said about the Ichabod not being real. She'd been so angry at the suggestion that her husband might have fallen off his horse that she hadn't realised she was reporting treason until the words were out of her mouth and it was too late to call them back. So she hadn't wanted still she hadn't really wanted to get an, such an old friend into trouble so she'd begged the scullery maid to forget what she said and mabel had agreed relieved mrs Be beamish had turned around to take a large batch of maiden dreams out of the oven then spotted kankaby the footman skulking in the corner Cal kankaby was known to everyone who worked at the palace as a sneak and a tell tattletale he had a knack of arriving noiselessly in rooms and peeking unnoticed through keyholes Mrs Beamish didn't dare ask Kankaby how long he'd been standing there, but now, sitting alone at her kitchen table, a terrible fear gripped her heart. Had... Um, had the news of Mr Dovetail's treason been carried by Kankaby to Lord Spittleworth, was it possible that Mr Dovetail had gone not to Pluritania, but to prison? The longer she thought about it, the more frightened she became until finally Mrs Beamish called out to Bert that she was going on need for an evening stroll and hurried from the house. There were still children playing in the streets and Mrs Beamish wound her way in and out of them until she reached the small cottage that lay between the city within the city gates and the graveyard. The windows were dark and the workshop locked up, but when Mrs Beamish gave the front door a gentle push, it opened. All the furniture was gone, right down to the pictures on the walls. Mrs Beamish let out a long, low sigh of relief. If they'd slung Mr Dovetail in jail, they'd hardly have put all his furniture in there with him. It really did look as though he'd pick, packed up and taken Daisy off to Pluritania. Mrs Beamish felt a little easier in her mind as she walked back through the city within the city. Some little girls were jumping rope on the ground road up ahead, chanting a rhyme now repeated in playgrounds all over the kingdom. Ichabog, Ichabog, he'll get you if you stop. Ichabog, Ichabog, so skip until you drop. Never look back if you feel squeamish. Cos he's caught a soldier called Major. One of the little girls turning the rope for her friend spotted Mrs Beamish, let out a squeal and dropped her end. The other little girls turned too and seeing the pastry chef, all of them turned red. One of them let out a terrified giggle and another burst into tears. It's all right, girls, said Mrs Beamish, trying to smile. It doesn't matter. The children remained quiet, quite still as she passed them, until suddenly Mrs Beamish turned to look again at the girl who dropped the end of the skipping rope. Where, asked Mrs Beamish, did you get that dress? The scarlet-faced little girl looked down at it, then back up at Mrs Beamish. My daddy gave it to me, Mrs, said the, said the girl, when he came home from work yesterday and he gave my brother a bandolore. After staring at the dress for a few more seconds, Mrs. Beamish turned and walked slowly away and walked turned slowly away and walked on home. She told herself she must be mistaken, but she was sure she could remember Daisy Dovetail wearing that beautiful little dress a beautiful little dress exactly like that, sunshine yellow with daisies embroidered around the neck and cuffs, back when her mother was alive and made all of Daisy's clothes. Chapter thirty The Foot 
A month passed. Deep in the dungeons, Mr. Dovetail worked in a kind of frenzy. He had to finish the monstrous wooden foot so that he could see Daisy again. He'd forced himself to believe that Spittleworth could keep his word and let him leave the dungeon after he'd completed his task, even though a voice in his head kept saying they'll never let you go after this. Never. To drive out fear, Mr. Dovetail started singing the national anthem over and over again. Corn, Ucopia, give praises to the king. Corn, Ucopia, lift up your voice and sing. His constant singing annoyed the other prisoners even more than the sound of his chisel and hammer. But now thin and ragged Captain Goodfellow begged him to stop. Stop, but Mr. Dovetail paid no attention. He'd become a little delirious. He had a confused idea that if he showed himself a faithful subject to the king, Spittleworth might think him less of a danger and release him. So the carpenter's cell rang with the banging and scraping of his tools in the national anthem, and slowly but surely a monstrous clawed foot took shape, with a long handle out of the top so that a man on horseback could press it deep into the soft ground. When at last the wooden foot was finished, Spittleworth, Flapoon and Major Roach came down into the gungeon to inspect it. Yes, said Spittleworth, slowly examining the foot from every angle. Very good indeed. What do you think, Roach? I think it will do very nicely, my lord, replied the Major. You've done well, Dovetail, Spittleworth told the carpenter. I'll tell the warder to give you extra rations tonight. But you said I'd go free when I finished, said Mr Dovetail, falling to his knees, pale and exhausted. Please, my lord, please, I have to see my daughter, please. Mr Dovetail reached for Spittleworth's bony hand, but Spittleworth snatched it back. Don't touch me, traitor. You should be grateful I didn't have you put to death. I may yet, if this foot doesn't do the trick. So if I were you, I'd pray my plan works. Oh no, so Mr Dovetail's not been released yet. Okay. So we're just going to do those two chapters there today and tomorrow we'll hopefully see how the foot gets used. Um, so check out Purple Mash, have a go at today's activity and I'll see you tomorrow to carry on with the story.